been released, um, co-edited by Adeoye Akinola, Irshan Kasaram, and Nokokanya Jili. Uh, and it's published by Palgrave Macmillan. We're very lucky to have um, one of the editors as our key speaker today. And uh, I will be explaining to you shortly the, the program for the afternoon. First of all, I must acknowledge and thank um, the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation, IPATC, at the University of Johannesburg for hosting this book launch. Um, and to encourage all of you, as you come and join us now, we are a small group. Let's imagine ourselves in a seminar room and, and make this as interactive as this medium allows. So right off, I'd like to ask all of you who are attending, please, uh, just to open up the chat and say hello, tell us who you are and where you're joining us from, and perhaps any institutional affiliation that you might have. Then we get to know who is in the room. So welcome again. Here we are to launch this book, The New Political Economy of Land Reform in South Africa, a significant uh, and substantial book of about 280 pages, published by Palgrave Macmillan. Um, uh, the one drawback I must put up front about this book is it's not cheap, but I hope that all of you will encourage your libraries to order a copy. Um, the book itself has 14 chapters, which cover a wide uh, range of themes within the broad area of land reform in South Africa, focusing particularly on questions of land expropriation, expropriation without compensation, um, there are chapters that look at that in a global context. Uh, there are chapters that deal with uh, questions around compensation specifically, around food security. Uh, and then there are several case studies that look at dynamics within land reform and land struggles in particular parts of the country. For instance, in uh, Limpopo, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, and elsewhere. I was pleased to see that there are two chapters that deal with what I think are underrepresented topics in the broad field, one of which is climate change and the other is urban land reform. Um, at this point, and thank you to those who are introducing themselves, please do uh, say who you are in the chat. I'm going to explain the format for this afternoon. Um, I want to make it clear, I'm, I'm not a participant in this book project, I'm just chairing the launch. Um, but I, I have worked in this area of land reform extensively, so I, I did wonder if I was invited to chair as, as one way to ensure that I wouldn't be too active in the chat. Um, but I'm assured that I'm allowed to abuse my position as chair and that I intend to do so. Uh, so welcome, everybody. What we're going to do now is we will be uh, having a keynote input from uh, one of the co-editors of the volume, that's Dr. Adeoye Akinola, who will, I will introduce in a moment. And he will take us through an overview of the book uh, and of the various chapters and arguments uh, contained in the book. Um, and then we will be hearing a response uh, with some further thoughts and reflections from Professor Tumo Maloka. Um, who is a professor at the University of uh, Limpopo, and I will introduce him further later on. So uh, after those two inputs, we will be able to open up for broader discussion. I encourage you to use not only the chat, but if you have specific questions or comments to the speakers, I encourage you to use the Q&A function uh, so that we can sort and collate through a number of comments and questions and make this as lively. And inclusive as possible. We don't have a hashtag today, but we do want to make it clear that we are going to be uh, sharing links uh, for ordering the book um, and that this uh, will be available as a video afterwards. So with that, um, please join me in welcoming our first speaker. I will introduce very briefly uh, now Dr. Adeoye uh, Akinola is a senior researcher at the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation at the University of Johannesburg. He obtained a doctorate in political science from UKZN. Uh, he was a lecturer at Obafemi Owolowo University in Nigeria and a postdoc fellow at UKZN and Zulu, Uni, UniZulu, and a visiting professor at the UP Africa Fellowship Program in Addis Ababa. He's also uh, published more books in the past. He was the author of a book entitled Globalization, Democracy, 
and oil sector reform in Nigeria. And he was editor uh, of the book Political Economy of Xenophobia in Africa and a co-editor of the book The Trajectory of Land Reform in Postcolonial African States. Uh, so he specializes in globalization, African political economy, development studies, resource government, governance, conflict, and peace studies. So with that short introduction, um, hello and welcome, Dr. Akinola, and we're looking forward to your summary of this book. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rutzhola. And I humbly sit before you and before everyone else in appreciation of the opportunity to contribute to the South African land discourse through the launch of our edited volume, uh, which I'm displaying now. These are the copies of the book, The Political Economy of Land Reform in South Africa. Uh, the journey actually began in 2013 when I joined a research team in UKZM, uh, which went to the Southern Kalahari on a two week fish trip, researching on the political economy of the Kumani San. I was actually shocked at the social economic environment in which, uh, in which the Kumani San were expected to farm productively. And I also recalled that we were informed that since 1991, there, were, there was no public electricity in the Southern Kalahari, no functioning markets to sell agricultural products, no school that were close by, no clinics or any functioning social amenities. Even part of the lands that were allocated to them were rocky, not arable, without effective government support system for uh, productive farming. One of the interviewees, which I spoke with, actually told me, and he said to me, he said, I am a farmer, but I have no farm. I, I didn't quite grasp it until another one said to me, I have a big farm, but I am not a farmer. Now, the contradictions exposed me to the complexity of the South African land reform scheme. And by 2015, after my doctoral studies, I fully began to research in this area, which led, in one way or the other, to the production of this edited volume. The chapters in the book rely on qualitative and quantitative research, talking about survey focus group and on structural interviews to properly locate the only land question in scholarship, in scholarship exposition for the benefit of researchers, policy makers, land practitioners, and others interested in the South African land question, particularly on the prospect and feasibility, and also the reality of the proposed exploitation without compensation. The book contains four chapters by a blend of old and emerging scholars from six different South African universities. Chapter one, which is the expropriation and the discontent of land reform in South Africa, by myself, Professor Kasuran, and Dr. Gilly contains the introduction and explores the decisive factors responsible for the contradictions inherent in the existing land policy and draws the convergence between the historical land dispossession and the choice of land expropriation. Chapter two by Professor Distan Aya and Ramashio Calvino examines how expropriation could be an effective tool for land reform and whether section 25 of the constitution requires amendment for expropriation to occur. Chapter three, globalization of South African land reform scheme, written by myself and Professor Kassura, relates land policy to the history of foreign domination, dependency and exploitation, and particularly the imposition of the new Libra or market-led reform agenda on the South African state. In chapter four, by Mandela Mbekwa and Victor Lambo, they explore the place of expropriation in alleviating or worsening poverty and unemployment. Chapter five by Dr. Zaba Zigaye critically engages the land question and the dilemma of expropriation without compensation and attributes his choice to ANC's quest for legitimacy, particularly during election. In chapter six on land expropriation, food security, and local economic development, Dr. Gili and M. Asuku hold that access to land constitutes life for the South Africans. 
and is a veritable instrument for security and inclusive development. While chapter seven on the quest for land reform, implication for integrated food security and nation building by Dr. Stella Sabi maintains that the persistent skilled land arrangement impedes agricultural productivity. Mm -hmm. And she advocates for a policy shift to reverse food insecurity and chronic poverty. In chapter eight, Dr. Listin Yingi uses the case of Balobedu in Limpopo to advocate for the adoption of expropriation as the best approach to redress the historical injustice to the entire Black race. Chapter 9, Small Scale Farming, Fourth Industrial Revolution and the Quest for Agricultural Development by the Lyunda Michali and myself, hold that the development of commercial farming, farming and its consolidation by 4IR will further underdevelop small scale farmers and alienate them from the chains of agricultural productivity, thereby deepening structural violence and hostility in the farming sector. Chapter nine by Professor Sultan Khan uses a case study of the Harigwala municipality in KwaZulu Natal to engage rural land reform and local economic development through the agri parks. Chapter 11 is written, is written by uh, Professor Tumo Maloka, who will be also joining us on the program. Chapter 12, talking about climate change and land issues in South Africa, a convergence by Dr. Lutala Oluwali examined the intersections between climate change and land-based resources and very skeptical about the place of climate development nexus in the proposed expropriation discourse. Chapter 13 on urbanization, poverty, and the paradox of land reform in South Africa, written by myself, links the development of urban centers, the cities, to the consequences of modernization and civilization in Africa, and explores how land reform impacts on rural urban migration and poverty urbanization converges. In chapter 14, written by Mudupe Daramola, on land reform and the quest for women's land rights in South Africa using the case of KwaZulu Natal. Udupa explores the complexity of the reform agenda and knows that the absence of strong gender construction in the existing land reform. And she was very unclear about how exploitation will resolve the gender inequality in land passes. Generally, the book offers an intellectual contribution to the vast issue of land in a democratic South Africa and presents a multi coveted opportunity to reconceptualize land, land hunger, and land policy in the contemporary South Africa we find ourselves today. Truly, the importance of land has changed and South Africa might not be strictly regarded as an agrarian society. However, land remains an important social property that should not be so totally to the invincible hands of the market, apology to, uh, to Adam Smith. The book adopts a political economic approach to the study and the practice of land reform in the country by unraveling the power relations between the owners of land and the landless majority. Broadly, it also explores the impact of land reform on the South African state, economy, and the society. No doubt, the unresolved land question has put pressures on the state to urgently develop a populist and radical approach to land reform, while the uncertainty surrounding land policies and expropriation agenda has taunted economic investment, particularly in the agricultural sector. And the society remains very divided between the minority who are the owners of capital such as land and the majority who constitute the landless or the historically are uh, dispossessed, thereby reinforcing the racialization of farm conflicts and farm murders, which we witnessed in South Africa in the past couple of years. Despite the disagreements over the most desirable land policy shifts, the fact remains that the existing reform agenda has failed to achieve the aims of government and the expectations of cross section of the targets of land reform. In South Africa, since 1994, consecutive governments have displayed a lackluster attitude towards land reform and the market-driven reform programs, particularly its incapacity to redress historical land dispossession and the attendant structural violence that characterize both the apartheid and post-apartheid South Africa. 
evictions of illegal land occupation, rising evictions, land-related murders, and violence on farms, and the failed farm projects have all revealed the struggles of existing land reform. From the rainforest of KwaZulu Natal to the far north of the Cape, compelling evidence of land failure exists. Building on the 1997 White Paper on Land Reform, the government in 2014 formed the current land policy on four pillars, restitutions, redistributions, land tenure system, land tenure reform, and development of the land. None of these are particularly achieved optimum performance, prompting a policy change. At this stage, we think in the existing land policy is a matter of necessity and not of a choice. Indeed, there are so many unanswered land questions as we sit here today. And we, I can begin to interrogate some of it. Why did the elites opt for the liberalization of land reform? And how do we explain its struggle over the years? Apart from the cost and poor government financing, why did the willing seller, willing buyer option fail? How do we reconceptualize land at this critical point in time? And what account for South Africans' effort to repackage land reform under the populist tag, land expropriation without compensation? And what also extends the securitization of land expropriation without compensation? How will the public benefit from expropriation? And what will be the determining factor to assess land in the new land regime? What is the place of women in the expropriation scheme? How practicable is the radicalization of land reform in a liberal state governed by constitutionalism? What are the cases of land and farm related corruptions we have recently witnessed? And the lack of clarity on the performance of stand laid as start state land and state farms. Debates around policy shift has revolved around two sharp divides. The majority would desire a reform agenda that preserves the status quo protect property rights by uh, property rights without significant disruption to agricultural production and food security. They are against the majority that fancy the transformation agenda, radicalization of land reform and the implementation of expropriation without compensation. Because as somebody said, he said, we have failed through the blows of our ancestors, through the blows of our grandfathers and even through the blood we are still shedding today. However, land expropriation without compensation may not be the magic one to make land available to the teeming majority. It may even later trap land in the hands of the government officials and few elites or make the land court more powerful than we have all anticipated. I will stop for now. Over to you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, and you were in time. That's a, a very broad framing of this discussion. Thank you very much. A, a few of the things that uh, strike me, and I think are important for framing our discussion today, is firstly that often uh, people talk of the land question, but in fact there are multiple questions. And perhaps we can elaborate on what those different questions are. Um, clearly, how to get the land, questions of expropriation, the status of property rights, the role of courts, um, and the nature of the constitution are part of that. But there are many other land questions in South Africa. So hopefully we will delve into those. Now, I'm seeing, um, I, I'm seeing a few questions uh, already in the chat. Will you be able to share today's recording? Uh, it will be available. And I, perhaps we can ask one of the uh, organizers at the end, just to give us a little bit more detail about how you can share this recording in the future. Um, there are various uh, comments in the chat. For now, I'd like to, just before handing over to our second speaker, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge, I think that some of our, some of the contributors to the book, the authors of the various chapters may be here. So I just want to say hello and welcome to any of the, um, the authors as well as, um, as our speakers, we have uh, among the authors are Ishad Kasaram and Nokokanya Jili, the co-editors, co also Desan Ayer and Rizel Ramacho Calvino, um, uh, and then also Mandla Mubekwa and Victor Mlambo, Mzingai Brilliant Kwaba, 
no, uh, as well as Mfundo Masuku, Stella Chewe, Sabi, Lusen Yengi, um, and Sultan Khan, Tuma Maloka, we'll hear from in a moment, Al Aluwole Olutula, uh, and Modupe Daramola. So welcome to those uh, of the authors who are able to be here. And I hope that you'll also be active in responding to the discussion. So thanks very much, uh, Dr. Akinola. So uh, let's move along. We're going to have a response um, and elaboration on, uh, on the book from Professor Tumo Maloka. As you know, he was one of the uh, contributors to the book. Um, and specifically, uh, he contributed to uh, the chapter dealing with land restitution and the idea of balancing the public interest uh, and socioeconomic development uh, in the, the Land Restitution Act of 1994. Professor Maloka is an associate professor in the Mercantile and Labor Law Department of the University of, Jahan of Limpopo. He obtained a BA, LLB and LLM from the University of Cape Town and also an LLD from Fort Ham. His academic footprints traverse several institutions and quite apart from specializing in labor law, he's published several articles on corporate law, cost awards in constitutional and public interest litigation, gender harms and land reform, specifically the restitution issue. And he's currently co-authoring a book on remedies in the law of unfair. So welcome uh, Professor Maloka. Um, colleagues, all participants, again, I encourage you to Put some questions or indeed your comments or provocations into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, so that we can have a lively debate after Professor Maloka's input. Over to you, Professor Maloka. You have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hall, uh, Dr. Akinola. Let me first uh, appreciate uh, this opportunity to participate in the visual launch. Greetings to all the uh, our visual audi audience. Uh, the editors, I must say, they, they deserve a special credit for sheer hard work. So too are uh, all the contributors. Uh, uh, the book itself is quite lean and muscular. So quite uh, apart from being the challenge, I'll try my best concisely to zoom into the core aspect of, 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 the, of the test. Uh, in my view, there are two distinct uh, contributions in the text. The other ones, the first part of the contributors, I'll say summarily they deal with uh, the three aspect pillars of land reform. And of course, there are also the other quite penetrating analysis from those who have uh, taken narrow but pertinent uh, uh, case studies, uh, a root and branch uh, analysis of, 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 of issues such as food security, local development, agri paths, decorative food uh, security, nation building, small uh, scale farming, urbanization, and poverty. So, in a sense, that uh, the book sort of covers the whole field, so to speak. However, mm -hmm. my, the, the slot of my presentation will be on the three pillars of, of land, land reform, which has been dealt extensively by several contributors uh, uh, in, in the book. The three main pillars of, of uh, land reform, which in a sense that have brought us where we are, the call for expropriation uh, of, of land without compensation. For ease of reference, there are three pillars, which is land uh, uh, restitution, uh, which uh, uh, is covered by Land Rights Act, uh, dealing with this disposition since uh, 19 June uh, uh, 1913. The other one is, uh, the second is redistribution, redistribution which also broadly uh, engages yeah. section 25 of, 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 of the constitution, which we'll talk about it. And of course the third arm, um, of, of land reform is land tenure reform, where we, uh, uh, the communal uh, rents, uh, 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 land rights act ar arises. As I've said that this aspect uh, has been dealt quite extensively. Of course, the, the perennially risking issue before us 
is the question of land expropriation without a, a, a compensation, which has been subject to a sustained uh, appraisal. And it speaks uh, broadly uh, to the failure of land reform in the last 25 years. And in effect, the abandonment, uh, so to speak, of the, uh, the willing buyer, willing seller, which, which uh, uh, happened in the last uh, 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 few years. And of course, closely associated with that call has been the call to uh, uh, amend section 25 of the constitution that that will perhaps in one way or the other uh, fast track land reform. A lot has been written uh, uh, around, around this, this, this aspect. But however, if one reflects on all the contribution with regard to the record of the state since 1994, uh, what the, the critical question that arises is whether the expropriation of land without compensation uh, uh, will on its own uh, fast track uh, 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 land redistribution and, and, and accelerate land reform. I'm, I'm recording this point in a sense that number of contributors have highlighted uh, uh, something that is uh, a staple that of the common of the public uh, uh, discourse. The administrative incapacity within the, uh, uh, the department itself, the problem of, co of, of collusion and chronism. These are aspects that have all, all, uh, almost uh, eclipsed this, uh, the noble goals of, 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 land, of land reform. And this may be actually uh, the elephant in the room. In my respectful view, uh, uh, the amendment of, of section 25 on its own is not likely uh, to lead to uh, acceleration of, of, of land reform for the very same reason that they've been isolated by the number of, of, of contributors, that uh, uh, whether capacity constrained, of course, the issues of, of finance, and of course the record that is, is with regard to, to the, the land uh, uh, reform in the last 25 years, uh, uh, does not on its own offer, offer, offer much of, 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 of hope that uh, the amendment or expropriation will uh, absent to uh, the other practical changes that ought to happen, will necessarily res uh, result in any in, in change. In, in effect, uh, uh, if one looks at the three pillars on the policy documents, all the policy documents are, are quite impressive. The, the pitfall has always been on the implementation uh, uh, side. And of course, it, it must also be appreciated. The state ordinarily, still has a lot of room to maneuver uh, under export. Absent the, uh, 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 the amendment of section 25, the state does have a means to effect expropriation in the public interest. And of course the constitution does not even talk about the market related uh, in, in a sense. One contributor, if I recall, uh, 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 highlighted the case of the Malamala where the state simply came in and paid a market fee, which they could have simply left it to, to uh, the constitutional court to determine what, uh, what is just and equitable in, in the circumstances. So uh, uh, really, uh, 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 in my view, there's a lot of, yes, the, uh, uh, politically, it looks good to talk about uh, amending the constitution, but I think the biggest problem has always been the implementation side. Of, of, of the policies. And the record does not actually uh, uh, speak well. I can, uh, these aspects have been detailed by, uh, by a number of, of, of contributors. So in my view, uh, 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 politically, yes, it's a politically charged and emotive issue around land. And of course, let's not remember this uh, uh, problem of land restitution uh, is a vexing issue across many jurisdictions. Uh, whether in the Commonwealth uh, is a quite emotive. Uh, uh, the law on its own uh, uh, coming from a, a law amending the text, I, I submit that might not necessarily address some of the pertinent issues that those who have talked about uh, case scenarios, the contributors have gone 
on on health month approach issues of human rights those dreams may actually be uh, still be deferred we know for example uh, uh, we are still sitting with the challenges uh, the other big issue around that uh, big trust around the, uh, the access to land uh, 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 which is still probably uh, going to go, go to, uh, uh, to appear before before the constitutional uh, uh, before uh, 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 so before the constitutional court so it, 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 uh, 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 I, 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 I will say for, for, for uh, the case studies I, uh, which uh, I've, I've gone through, uh, clearly for me, they suggest that uh, the, uh, 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 tweaking the law may not necessarily, uh, the list is section 25 uh, on its own absence. It looks like uh, uh, on the side of the state, there's, no, there's a lack of political will because the tools are already available if one looks at the experience under Land Restitution Act, it's on its own. Uh, one is very, uh, uh, my reading of the experience and the record, quite cautious that this could be uh, a, a magic wand on, on, on its own. Uh, uh, but a lot of work needs, needs to, uh, 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 to, to be done. There's no doubt about that. Uh, 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 this on its own is a, is, is a, is a, is a perennial vaccine, uh, migraine for all sectors of of, of society, because uh, when you talk about uh, 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 social cohesion, the issue of land is actually embedded in many aspects of, 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 of our own livelihood. I actually implemented uh, uh, around land. Uh, uh, for me, I see, I read all the contribution as, uh, 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 as opening the further debate, uh, because this matter, I, 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 I'll, I'll say that, will still probably for another century we'll still have to engage it. But there's a start, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, the contribution, uh, actually the, the book on its own, uh, I, I think is a rich harvest uh, 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 for, for scholars to all of us to continue on, 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 the, on the challenges, yes. They've been moved around empowering the land court and, and uh, other things, but I think a lot uh, uh, still uh, uh, to, to be done. Uh, on, in, 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 in this very, very challenging aspect of society. society. It's a quite a, a divisive, uh, there's no question about that. There are no easy answers, but as a, uh, uh, for me, I, I, I read the effort by the editors, this is simply a starter uh, 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 to open the debate and all of us to uh, tackle the elephant in the room. Uh, I hope, uh, uh, Chair, I've been concise enough without uh, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maloka. Um, and uh, I think several of the participants are appreciating uh, your input. So um, at this point, and I see there are some questions, some for clarity, some for further elaboration. I don't see any vociferous disagreement yet. So I'm still waiting for the debate to happen. Um, in view of that, I'm going to abuse my position and very briefly um, give some responses and thoughts uh, provoked by both of your inputs and by, I must say, my skim reading uh, of parts of the book. And the one thought is, in a sense, and I would post this maybe to both of you if you'd like to comment, it's this idea of a new political economy of land reform. And to my mind, a political economy suggests a particular theoretical framing and particularly um, uh, a class analytic uh, framing, thinking about the nature of classes and interests uh, within a capitalist society. So I was wondering um, in what ways or how you feel that the contributors to the book dealt with, on the one hand, the one framing around um, thinking about uh, land dispossession as part of the history of the development of capitalism, indeed racial capitalism in South Africa, and integral to our economic system, and how much it was dealt with uh, through the lens of the national question and questions of race and decolonization. So I'd be interested in your reflection on how you as a team discussed that. And um, a second thought uh, that strikes me, and um, this is particularly uh, to you, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Akinola, perhaps you'd want to reflect you um, spoke very eloquently of the phenomenon of farmers without farms and farms without farmers. 
And of course, South Africa is um, uh, widely considered to be one of the most de-agrarianized societies um, in Africa, in which although large numbers are, of people remain on the land, they don't necessarily derive their, land, their livelihoods from uh, agrarian production. At the same time, we have increasingly corporatized and centralized forms of production and capital accumulation in agriculture uh, that's widely connected into other parts of the economy that isn't um, individual uh, commercial farmers. So in a sense, th these, ra these contexts raise challenges to our thinking about what land reform is for and what change it's intended to bring about in our society. Um, uh, to uh, Professor Maloka, I was uh, glad that you mentioned and clarified that South Africa um, has adopted this three-pronged approach to land reform. Um, I think that often we take that as if it's a given, um, but in, to my mind, the crafting of the idea that we have redistribution, restitution, and tenure reform is actually very much a product of a particular historical conjuncture. And I'm reminded how in the 1990s, or in the late 80s, at the beginning of political negotiations, it was by far from clear that there would be distinct programs of this kind. And many presumed that liberation would mean nationalization of land. And it was only rarely with the confirmation of private property um, being, uh, being allowed to continue that a specific program of restitution was crafted um, and that would set aside a certain group of people who would have entitlements separate from the rest of the citizenry. Um, so it, it strikes me that the three branches are not necessarily uh, sort of inherently um, self-evident. They're a product of history uh, and that the restitution program itself uh, was part of a compromise um, that, was, uh, that was made in the 1990s. It's been very striking, I think, in the past uh, few years, as we've been debating uh, questions of, for instance, what is equitable access to land, that increasingly people are becoming aware that these three pillars of land reform are not separate from one another. One should think of them as connected, that providing secure tenure to people who've been denied secure land rights actually requires redistributive reforms. It's not enough just to upgrade people's uh, weak rights to very limited property. And similarly, uh, restoring land is meaningless unless that restoration results in secure rights and democratic governance of rights. Um, and so in a sense, one has to dismantle, I think, in some of our thinking, the sharp divide between these three programs. They might make sense from a governmental bureaucratic way, uh, sense. But uh, I think that in terms of the wider politics and the demands, not only for access to land, but for secure access to good quality land in the right places with the right kinds of support, one needs to think of them as, as very much connected. I would love to say more, um, but I think that maybe I should just, um, uh, before opening up and asking you to respond, let's just check the Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Abdullahi Odowa, who asks one question, I think, just of clarification. Currently, what's the most common form of land acquisition in South Africa? And perhaps we can distinguish land acquisition generally from land acquisition within the government's land reform program. Um, the second question from the same uh, participant is, does the book address the broader question on gender and land ownership? in South Africa. In some parts of Africa, women are not allowed to own land. What's the current situation in South Africa? So perhaps we can um, distinguish between statutory and customary uh, legal frameworks. Um, uh, perhaps uh, it would be most appropriate uh, to ask uh, Professor Maloka to, um, to address those questions around acquisition and gender. And Dr. Akinola, perhaps you could answer a question from Uduak Johnson, who says, firstly, thank you. This is an excellent discourse, but I struggle to understand the statement that a policy, that a policy is impressive while there are implementation problems. Should we not rethink this logic, logic since a policy can be understood um, to always be in the process 
that it's being made. I think that that's talking about the policy making process. How do we think of a policy process? Um, a policy can't be good on paper only um, if uh, the beneficiaries of, the, of this policy weren't involved in the development. So I think that that goes to questions of, are we looking at um, more inclusive and democratic forms of policy making in South Africa uh, or not? Um, I will hold my own views on that. So I hope that you've managed to gather from those short comments um, just a few questions, um, some provocations from me perhaps, uh, and three questions from the participants. Let's take a round of responses and then uh, go back for more questions. Um, Professor Maloka, would you like to start uh, with your responses first? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, quite uh, uh, pointed questions, uh, yes. Just uh, uh, to preface uh, 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 the relationship between the three pillars, I must concede ordinarily we read them as if they are separate, uh, uh, but they're actually quite, uh, 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 there's a tight relationship between the three of them. You know? and, and of course, uh, the current debate that has happened in the last year, in a way, some, some created a misimpression that there, there's not been measures to address the issue of, of length. You, you, uh, uh, and of course, this, uh, the three policies, let's not forget, uh, 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 this is the result of a political settlement. The cutoff of 19, it was a political uh, uh, settlement on its, uh, 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 itself. Uh, a question that, uh, about the, the most common form of acquisition of land. Uh, I, I will have to cut to the chase. Currently, uh, well, if you talk about the majority, people are simply occupying spaces. Informally, that's the most common. The most common, whether we go to any provinces, informally people have been told just occupy, occupy that piece of land. Uh, uh, you'll be regularized later. That's the most common. I'm talking about the majority. That's the most common of, of, of land acquisition in the country. We know that there are eloquent political voices that generally advocate that form of acquisition. And that's a, a, a most form of, if you look at, the expansion of the urban frontiers is not generally in a regulated form. Uh, the other question pertains to the relationship between gender uh, 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 and land. Yes, this question, I think it has been dealt by three uh, contributors in different ways in the text. I know the, I, I forgot the, uh, the name, but there is one about human rights. Uh, also in the other contribution, whether by Gili, those issues are also embedded. Yes, that question of the question of, of, of women's rights. And of course, it speaks to the fact that uh, uh, whether we, we go for expropriation, will it actually address uh, the embedded inequalities on the ground? Uh, uh, that is, those, those uh, uh, about three contributors, they have dealt with the issue of, 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 of women. As I said that, if we, we take a peek on the, the big trust, the experience on that way, uh, the prognosis is not good as far as the position of women. If you look at the, the big trust in the, in the country uh, where uh, litigation is going on, and of course, it's centered around the marginalization of women and their lack of tenure. Uh, 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 so yes, on 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 there is a, 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 a there's been a genuine attempt to address that that question. And of course, as I said, that it is a matter that we are uh, some of us are watching how this matter, the crucial court, is going to evolve the issue between that trust and the so the the, the beneficiaries who are actually not bene beneficiating. We know that these are quite a sensitive, but that's what uh, uh, the court is meant to address those kind of questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Maloka. You know what brings to mind um, uh, immediately when you're talking about the women is, um, is uh, issues around uh, the current contestation of a customary law uh, and particularly the failure to, over many years, to provide any kind of not only legal clarity but institutional mechanisms 
to assure gender equality in access to and governance of land. Uh, and of course, now there's currently a contestation over the traditional courts bill and the connection between uh, the judicial uh, functions of traditional authorities and their power over women's land rights. Um, so these are contentious issues. Um, over to you, Dr. Akinola. There were several provocations, uh, also questions around political economy and the framing theoretically uh, of the book. Um, and also uh, that one question around uh, the participatory uh, nature of, of, of policy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Prof. And uh, let me start by saying that we can go back to Marxism. Uh, of course, uh, since political economy has uh, come into the picture or Leninism. And if we recall the, 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 their writings, especially at the early day, when they were talking about historical materialism, we were talking about societies, for instance, the most recent would be feudalism society, feudal society, whereby we have two classes contending for land or the society evolved into capitalism. And ordinarily, capitalism ought to just be the exchange of just goods and services, a movement of goods and services. But we have seen not only the movement of goods and services, but of capital itself and the transformation of, of capitals. So in the capitalist society, as we have in South Africa, like it predicted almost more than a century ago, we have two clear divides. We have the people that own the capital and they hold on to the capital. And we have the people that are struggling to assess uh, the capital like lunch, uh, uh, for instance. You know, I, was in, I was in Kimberley and I, I met with one of the directors of, uh, of land reform. I don't want to mention the specific ministry. And he told me that, look, I, I'm a senior official in the Ministry of Land and something else but I do not have a land in my region. None of my family members can lay claim to a pursuit of land. And in the same environment, somebody told me who I also interviewed that his own family have 36 hectares of land unused and that they only use it for maybe wedding ceremony once in a while, not really that they are using it productively. And that's exactly what we are talking about. We are talking about power relations between the people that own the capital and the people that do not. And that's why we have seen conflict in, on farms now. The same power relation, the owners of the farm owns everything, almost including the people working on the farm. And the people, especially in the South Africa, the people have been historically, you know, disempowered. And the only thing they could lay claim to naturally is these pieces of lands. And unfortunately, many of them are also still being consistently denied. I was in, in a village close to Richards Bay, and a farmer told me that, look, my situation from now and almost 40 years before has not changed. I was a farmer before the end of apartheid. I'm still a farmer now. I have access to land now, but it's not productive. Why? Because I engage in sugar, sugar cane production, but I could not even compete in the open market. The kind of sugar cane we are planting is the local breed. They even stop buying it. They prefer to import breeds from Zimbabwe and all of that. And I cannot compete. But the man has been given so large expanse of land, and yet the situation has remained the same impoverishment. That's why I'm saying we need to reconsider how people are related. Land before apartheid has changed. It's not the same as land now. We know before people were saying, give me land so that we could be productive. But now many of them have land, yet yeah, they are still not productive. We have seen farm. That's why we talk about farmers without farm and farm without farmers. We have seen many farm, productive farms that have been reallocated to some people and the land has become barren. Nothing is going on, not because they don't have the intellectual or the capacity to develop such farm, but the support system is just lacking. I went to a market near Askam, close to the border of Namibia, and they told us that before, during apartheid and shortly after apartheid, it was a brilliant you know, market, goods and services, agricultural products. But after they relocated, or they did redistribute it to somebody else who couldn't manage the farm. Now, if you go there now, you just see 
many dogs running around what ought to have been a productive family system. In a capitalist society, the capitalists do not care. Most of, not because they are wicked, that's the nature of the economic system. They do not care about what happened around their capital. They are only interested in keeping their capital and using surplus value to regenerate more income. And that's what we have seen in South Africa. You see a rainforest where people are constructing industry and you see, go to the cave, you see rocky land and they are forcing people to farm on rocky land. And it's just the nature of, of the society and the government seems lacking the capacity to actually decisively act. That's what we have seen. In, in relation to the policy, of course, what my, my, my friend was saying was just that it, we, can, we can acclaim the, the policy draft at the initial stage when they are drafting the policy. It could be impressive. People could submit many beautiful suggestions, but when it enters the policy process, as David Easton once described through the decision-making process or the system theory, talking about input and output, at that point in time, the policy might be badly implemented. If it is badly implemented, expectedly, there ought to be a feedback coming back to the government for the government to have a rethink of the policy, engage with the targets of the policy, and come up with another policy. But what we have seen in this land sector is just that the government started from the top, imposed expropriation on the people. They didn't discuss it. The government just came out and announced to people that we want to expropriate without compensation. And the question we're asking, how did you come to that? What are the policies that involve such a policy, policy change? I'm not talking about the system policy change, but people ought to debate and come up with expropriation, not from top, from top to the bottom. So that has been the problem, and we have seen it across. Uh, if you look at the state, we are, we are not condemning the state. But if, if the state is struggling to manage ESCOM, for instance, struggling to manage SAA, for instance, it will be very difficult for them as it is to actually manage uh, the land sector the way they are putting it forward now. Dr. Akinola, you've, um, you've somewhat brought us to one of the core cool, um, sort of uh, open questions that I think uh, I would like us to, to engage with, which is about the politics. Uh, and I think that one of the chapters, I believe it's the one by uh, uh, Brilliant uh, Kaba, uh, dealt explicitly with the political context uh, and the party political dynamics um, that frame our expropriation without compensation debate. It strikes me also though that um, the debate around expropriation without compensation um, equates um, uh, expropriation and compensation as if um, these are meant to be achieving the same ends. To my view, they're entirely different, expropriation being essentially a mechanism uh, for compulsory acquisition and compensation being a, a question of, of diverse approaches to whether or not people should be compensated. Um, and having worked in this area for um, around 25 years, uh, I recall the discussions about who should carry the costs. And uh, of course, I think that it's always worth putting this into historical context uh, and moving perhaps out of our South African parochial framing of the land question. Um, here, I'm thinking about three people who I think really help us to expand our thinking on the land question and to embed it more in a wider African story. The one is Samir Amin and his work from 1972, where he talked about uh, three Africans that emerged from different colonial conquests. So he talks about uh, Africa of the trading economies uh, in, in West Africa, which was very much about cash crop production by uh, peasant farmers, and I'm sure you know that context very well. Um, then there is the Africa of the concession economies. We think very much about uh, the DRC, Central Africa, the big uh, mining and other kinds of concession uh, uh, forms of colonialism. And then we have the settler colonies. And here we are as a settler colony um, uh, dealing with a land question in a moment of late capitalism, of huge concentration of wealth 
globally, financialization of our economies, and trying to undo a colonial question in that context. So that's why I think Samir Amin is useful for us to think and embed our conceptualization within the concept of settler colonialism and its particular legacies. The second is, um, is really also, and, and, and related to this, is Mahmoud Mamdani's work, uh, where he explicitly um, challenges the South African um, political and intellectual debates, which had been at that time in the 1990s, very separated from the rest of the continent. And in his citizen and subject work, was saying, well, listen, actually, yeah, apartheid, the creation of native reserves, etc. These are ideas that have been practiced across um, colonies. These are models used in the USA. These are models used around the continent. Uh, but formalized into segregation and apartheid in a particular way in South Africa. And uh, I think that one of the authors in this case coming uh, not from a nationalist, but from a Marxist perspective who, who built on that was Henry Bernstein, whose work also, in fact, I think it was the same year as Citizen and Subject. His, his key article was about the agrarian question in South Africa, what he called extreme but not exceptional. And in that sense, the extent of dispossession uh, through colonialism in South Africa might be extreme, but it's not exceptional. Um, so I always think it's, it's worth us connecting these debates with what's happening elsewhere. Um, today at lunchtime, we had a, a webinar on the revision of the Mozambican land policy. The land policy of Mozambique, a country which nationalized its land decades ago, uh, and has one of the most progressive land laws, um, is in the process of being revised in ways that will promote the commodification of land, the transaction of community land via the state to international investors uh, in processes that have been widely criticized as land grabbing. So there are processes of concentration of, of land all around us at the same time that we're trying to redistribute. To my mind, that poses big challenging questions. But uh, in that regard, let's go to some of the questions. Pachi Pa Mue, I'm not sure that I'm saying your name right, um, uh, has asked two questions, one of which, and this is provoking this thought about connecting with a neighboring countries and other African land questions. Uh, Pachi Pa Mue says, what has been the land reform and broader question uh, around neighboring Africans owning land in South Africa. Um, I don't know if either of you, do you want to indicate if anyone wants to talk about foreign ownership of land um, and that debate. Um, and the next question from the same participant is trying to redress the 1% owning more than 90% of the land and just being told to occupy land is parallel to land invasion or grab in Zimbabwe with dire consequences. Ah, Thank you very much. So it's Elvis. Elvis, thank you very much for your two questions. So I think that the second one goes to this question of, um, of land occupation uh, as, as one response. Uh, and of course, increasingly, this discourse of expropriation without compensation in South Africa is being seized upon by, um, by movements of people who are occupying land and they're saying, we are doing land expropriation without compensation from below. We're not waiting for the state. Uh, but perhaps, um, would you like to comment on uh, Elvis's uh, question, have we learned anything from the nature of land occupations in Zimbabwe? And uh, is this uh, the only route for the, for the, 19, well, for the landless majority um, to gain access to land? Uh, so perhaps uh, you'd like to respond to Firstly, how do we reconnect our South African land debates with the debates around access and tenure of land elsewhere on the continent? Um, and, uh, and secondly, these questions around foreign ownership of land, whether by other Africans or, or indeed other foreigners, uh, and the question about what do we learn from Zimbabwe? Certainly one of the most contentious issues in this debate, um, how to interpret um, events in Zimbabwe and what they mean for us in South Africa. Um, so over to you, who would like to start? Uh, Dr. Akinola, would you like to pick from those questions? And, uh, 
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. And uh, the first question I will also pose back is, what do we mean by foreigners? Uh, that's the first place to start. Who is foreign? Who is native? Uh, what are the determining factors? So if I reside in Limpopo, where my friend here is living, and his uncle resides at the other bridge, which is Zimbabwe, and they are both from the same household. So when the Zimbabwe comes into South Africa, it becomes a foreigner. And when he moves into Zimbabwe, it becomes also a foreigner. That's the first place to start with. But in South Africa, because the, the, the issue goes beyond just South African citizens. South Africa has been regarded across the continent as a place whereby you can come and flourish as an African. People don't want to see themselves as foreign when they are in South Africa. Now, when it comes to the issue of land, uh, it's actually a very sensitive uh, sensitive engagement. There was a time the government was talking about putting a cap on foreign ownership of land. And one who understand that in a society where the average South African couldn't lay claim to just one plot, not even for business, just for peace and family or for household needs. And you have a foreigner that has maybe 95 hectares in the United Kingdom or in, in Lesotho, wherever, coming to South Africa to say buy of land. That's where the sensitivity comes in and the government should be able to balance this. As much as we encourage foreigners to come and put investment, it shouldn't be at the detriment of our own people or the majority. If we want to, Clear <laughs> to relate to the questions that say South Africa belongs to all that live in it. If we believe it, be, it belongs to all that lives in it, like me and you, then they should equally have access to land, particularly if that land will be used productively. Uh, that's the way I see it. Then, of course, across Africa, there's always the politicalization of land. It's there in Ghana, where many of the African countries, they, they have the they don't have the same situation with South Africa. Which, you know, South Africa and maybe Namibia, Zimbabwe have a peculiar problem because, like you noted, it's settler uh, colony, not big, not like Nigeria, for instance, where the British maybe one thousand of them came and did what they had to do. After 1960, they returned back to Britain. But in the case of Southern Africa, they came to stay. We cannot continue to use the Zimbabwe template as a justification or motivation for land policy in South Africa. The same way we can't use democracy in Zimbabwe to begin to define democracy in South Africa. Different socio-political environment, different types of people, different economies. So it could have failed in Zimbabwe. That does not mean that they fail in South Africa, even if they expropriate. What the government is talking about, even despite the fact that they are not making it clear to the majority, they are not just talking of grabbing all the lands around them. No, they, they, in many instances, well, as you know, they will still pay some cons for compensation. But what they are saying is that the government would determine if to pay or not. That's the danger. It's different from the Zimbabwe whereby they just grab land. Like my friend also said in South Africa, I've, I've gone around and you've seen people, you ask them, is this your house? They say yes. Is this your land? And they say yes. Now, how is it your land? They said the council law related with some people and they allocated the land to them through the redistributive policy. Can you show me any evidence? Is there a title? Did to show that this land belonged to you. And the question is no. And they tend to argue, but in the colonial era, but we don't use that to this. But this is no more the colonial. So the, the, the land problem in South Africa is so deep, deeper than expropriation. Expropriation is just by the way. There are many intrinsic questions we need to be posing. Who, 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 who determines who to get who when land is expropriated? What of the land in the hands of the government that are unproductive? They are not using the land. Many farms, the farms are unproductive. Why not give us such lands? I went to a place, I won't mention it, and somebody just pointed, I said, do you see that plantation? I said, that land belongs to the head of the community. I'll just use that word. And he said, she said, you dare not touch that land. Those are the questions we need to be concerned in the country. And without going deeper to allow my friend to talk, I think, Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I must at this point just interrupt the, the process to say it's been clarified to me that in fact the participants can speak. I thought that on this uh, function 
uh, participants could not. So my apologies, I will no longer read out your question. Rather, I will ask you to say it to yourself. Could we start, um, Elvis, I have given you permission to speak. Perhaps you could uh, speak to your comment or question regarding uh, this question about what we learn from uh, Zimbabwe and land invasions. Um, would you like to pose that question directly um, and, and join us uh, here by speaking directly? Unmute yourself and, and speak, and perhaps we can ask Professor Maloka to respond to that. Elvis? Uh, probably to allude to my question was the fact that if taking into account the question of the land grabbing which happened in Zimbabwe in 1999-2000, it was so haphazard, so much that people could not even afford to be farmers on the land, yet they did not even have an X or even a, a hole just to dig one hole to put seeds in the ground, so much that it was haphazard. So at the end, some of the productive farms were probably like if this, some of the people, the farmers, they had even built schooling for the community and even health care system for the community. That went into drain within a split of a of weeks, yet that has been in, in place for probably 30 or so years. So in that instance, I feel as much as the willing buyer, willing seller approach did not really work as per uh, the Lancaster agreement, something should have been done better than doing the invasion of giving anyone land, yet I cannot even, even me, I was given land, but I didn't even have an idea of farming. I was just used to uh, agrarian, I mean, to peasant farming. So much that me giving me land was the worst than probably having negotiated as much as probably the, those who owned the land in the 1% were not probably forthcoming, depending with the compensation it could have been handled in a more better way, but, but, it, but it took longer anyway. From 1980 up to 19, 2020, years, still negotiating the same topic, and maybe it could be different in South Africa, it could be different in other countries. But the main thing was probably there should be a, it should be a learning curve to other countries, like what the Portuguese when, we did when they left Mozambique and all the plantation, they left to whatever they did to the, to the planting equipment. So there should always be a learning curve such that doesn't happen again in another country. As much as uh, uh, Professor Conolo mentioned that what happened is not a problem might work in a different country, but there should always be a learning. Any positive is as good as negative. Okay. Thanks very much, Elvis. Um, as somebody famous once said, um, history repeats itself, uh, first as um, uh, tragedy than as fast. Well, hopefully uh, we, we won't go too fast. But I, I mean, just a reflection on the Zimbabwean debate is that perhaps there are more than two positions um, around, firstly, uh, the extent to which land occupations were orchestrated by the state or were spontaneous um, uh, sort of expressions of political struggle, uh, but also the extent of elite capture, uh, political cronies taking over farms, versus uh, people who were landless or land poor being able to eke out, um, you know, uh, increased access to land. And on that, actually, the evidence is very mixed. Um, work done by the late Professor Moyo um, and his Institute for uh, Agrarian Studies uh, suggests actually, to a degree, a process of re-peasantization with many people from communal areas taking over land. In other areas, uh, it's very clear that large commercial farms were taken over by by political elites, but this is such a lively and complex debate of, it, of its own. And one observation is that a lot of the, the studies in Zimbabwe look at different regions of the country. So for instance, sorry, so the, the, uh, the white highlands being very different uh, from, the, from the poorer agroecological areas. So there's always an ecological element, uh, but thank you for that. Uh, Sorry, uh, Professor Maloka, do you want to come in around this issue of yeah, that? Yeah, just a few, few yeah. comments. Uh, there's Zimbabwean experience in my view. Uh, it actually looms large, even around the a debate around the, uh, the expropriation. You'll recall that the president, uh, even after saying we support it, there was a rider around food security. That has always been the rider around, around, uh, around food, food security. The, the, 
the occupation that's happening is slightly different if I look at it. It's more urban driven than uh, what we have, what what occurred in in in, in Zimbabwe. But that, the Zimbabwean experience, uh, even if you follow the debate within the governing party, is always looming large. There's always a qualification even around the expropriation. The other important, interesting, which you uh, uh, brought it into was Mamdani uh, 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 and the other. For me, the question that we, we, we perhaps not have interrogated, what does it mean when the charter says that South Africa belongs to all who live in it? I'm, I'm thinking about it, reading the background of Mamdani, neither the citizen and the, and the settler, where a, a, a local doesn't have ownership of in a piece of land. It, it, it's one thing that, of course, I, 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 I ask myself, that what does it mean if you don't even own a piece of land? Uh, uh, you don't even have any, any, but you have a political a document that says that South Africa belongs to all, uh, uh, all who live in it. It may perhaps also address uh, what uh, Dr. Aguinola talks about, who is a foreigner? Because that uh, 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 document seems to say, Clearly, if you in South Africa belongs to all who live in it, that presupposes that at least you must own a, a piece, a piece, of, piece of land. So when you raise Mamdani, for me, that to what extent uh, that uh, document uh, can we perhaps uh, align with Mamdani? The whole issue around citizenship, post-colonial society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now let's make this uh, more interactive. I'm going to ask uh, one of our participants, uh, Omiwole Joseph. Uh, you've asked a question uh, in the Q&A. Perhaps you'd like to pose that question to us. If you could put your video on, that would be even better than we can see you. Uh, and I think that uh, Dr. Akinola will, will respond. Uh, Omiwole, could you go ahead and ask your question? Thank you very much. I've been following the arguments, the land issue, and some other things is very, very interesting. Sincerely, I'm not so much used to issue in the, the Southern Africa as much, but this issue of a uh, land matter, I look at it that with the current situation of things in the world now, uh, is it possible for any government to place a kind of restriction on how much land a particular individual uh, can have. Because if you look at the trend of things in the world now, you discover that if you don't have that capital, if you don't have that money, it's as if you are out of the system already. So it is those people that have, that will continue grabbing the land, doing whatever they like with it. But sincerely, if we can have a kind of restriction order that can say that, okay, no matter how much you have, at least you have to leave something for some other people to, to enjoy. You can only buy this kind of a particular land. Is it possible in South Africa? Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Dr. Akinono, for your answer. Uh, thank you, Prof. And I will also say again, this is a complex question. Um, you know, this is a capitalist society governed by liberal constitution. And people have the rights of property ownership. And the government have to be careful in, in this aspect by not dramatically, uh, how do I say, restricting the rights of individual to own properties. Land has been regarded as a property. Of course, we can argue that it's a social property and that's one of the properties that cannot be manufactured, cannot be extended. We have limited, um, response of land. But what I think the government could do in as much as they, can, they might not be able to put a limit of what individual can buy. Because I tell you, people have all, ki all kinds of way of getting lands even without using their names. I, we went to Durban North during one of our field study and somebody pointed us to where people got lands through their children, both born and unborn through fake certificates and, and all of that. So I, I, my name might be on the land as the owner might not be the owner. So even if you put a limit to what people can buy, 
the, 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 the capitalists will still find a way of changing the law. That's number one. We must also know that those capitalists do not come from heaven. They are here controlling the government. They are friends to public officials. They sit during dinner, during lunch, and they decide what is going to happen in the country. So it will be extremely difficult for governments to put a cap what an individual can own. But what take also this to say, if the land is not productive, then we take it. But it's also difficult to determine when the land is productive or not, because it can be productive this year, but the next two years not productive. And I know government is coming for inspection. I put tractors on the land and begin to till. So this is a very complex question. Uh, and it's not something that the government can just uh, approach through laws. Please, based on your based on your, based on your analysis now, Dr. Akinola, it means it may be difficult to at least to peg the amount of land that can be possessed by any capitalist. Then, uh, don't you think that we be heading towards crisis with that? Because it can't continue like this forever. When you push people to the world, automatically they will turn back. Like what is happening on the issue of uh, the, the, the recent issue that are going on in uh, South Africa on the, this issue of uh, racism and some other things. Don't you think if there is no law, if government decided not to take decisive action on how to pacify or how to make sure that at least they try one or two things to make sure that at least the common man they get one or two things to fall back upon. Don't you think they will come back to the society and start causing problems? Yep. Uh, Dr. Akinola, last comment in response? Uh, yes, uh, we, we, we are making a mistake also to think that the government is responsible for all of the problem in the land sector. No, it's not just about the government. There are lands that belong to customary ships and they have also refused to give those land freely to the people. Many of them have used this as a control system. There are lands that belong to associations and even members of the association complain that some of the time they have to go behind the doors to have access to the land that belongs to all. I can use the case of the, the Southern Kalahari as an example. Many of them who have the legitimate right to own that land complain that that land were given to them for a few years, one, two years. So I, I'm saying it's not just about the government. Even the lands that are not within the control of the government, they are it's still extremely difficult even for people to access it. And that's why I'm saying it, it's so difficult in this arrangement, in the capitalist arrangement, for government to just say, you cannot have more than one. Effort. Even if you make the law, I tell you that law will not survive the, the daylight because Find a way like uh, Dr. Akinola, this brings to mind actually, I think from 2004 to 2007, uh, there was a ministerial commission looking into, uh, uh, a, uh, into uh, a limitation on the sizes of land holdings and also into foreign ownership of land. And we've even had draft legislation to try and limit the sizes of land ceilings, um, but it has gotten, gone nowhere over time. And to my mind, the, the, the main lesson perhaps from attempts elsewhere in the world to impose land ceilings, a, a key example would be parts of India, uh, where attempts have been made to impose land ceilings have been partly successful. Um, but we know that uh, a lot of land holding by companies is very hard to trace who are the owners. And so as we move towards less away from individual private ownership towards more corporate ownership, possibilities for limiting uh, the concentration of land holdings become so much um, less. Now let's have two people who are asking questions uh, to actually join us and ask away. Uh, Gail, you had a question. Uh, would you like to put it uh, to the panel? And straight after that, we're also going to have uh, Patrick. Um, Patrick, if you wouldn't mind asking your, your question after Gail. Gail, go for it. And as often happens, the thing, the process gets more and more lively just as we come towards the end. So let's keep our questions and answers short. Gail, over to you. Good afternoon to you all. Um, my question was just, I'm dealing with a family situation currently on land. And that is my great grandparents arriving in the country 
in 18, the eight, late 1800s. So there was land in Mozambique. There was land, well, that time it was Lorenzo Marx and as well as Zimbabwe. And then land that they bought, which we have the papers. But because that side was the Indian side, um, there it's fully said that only males can acquire this land. Um, we now so many years and decades down, a century down the line, and as granddaughters, we are now sitting and saying, so where does this leave us now? Because we can't say the grandsons must take this land only. Um, and then from the Portuguese side, Spanish side, um, in Mozambique side, we also, and in Pumalanga, we have them where they bought land over there. And currently we have a situation where that there is not really the gender-based side, but it's just the fact that that's been like a century ago. So getting all those papers now and looking at how as Portuguese Spanish people, they had to have English names and surnames, that has become a challenge for us working on a family tree Plus, where, where do we go to? Because the land is there. Um, the stand numbers are in their names. All the plots and whatever is their names. But the challenge is that, one, there's gender. The other one is the ownership. And the other one is where do we find the other family? Um, because they did start the Polana Hotel. And they were quite famous in those days for a lot of um, things. Uh, Mashada Dorp, and they were part of the Mashada family. So I'm just going to stop there to say Thank you. that's it. It's, it's a just, complex it's a question. question. In a moment, I'm going to ask uh, in his final closing comments uh, for Professor Maloka to respond. Very briefly, um, Patrick. Uh, Patrick, would you mind not just um, unmuting yourself, but also putting on your video if you can? It's always nice to see people. Uh, in one minute, can you ask your question or make your point, Patrick? I, uh, I can't see where I can put my video on. Uh, okay. I, I wish can I hear you. Mm. Right. Um, given that uh, South Africa's agricultural sector is classified as being dualistic with two distinct uh, what lessons can South Africa learn from the work that's been done by Twende Pishone, uh, Ian Skunz, and uh, mm. who, whose paper, they pub which, pub which was published in February this year, mm. points to the development of uh, distinctly of distinctly three sectors within the Zimbabwean uh, environment. Um, and secondly, as, as uh, an ancillary question to that, uh, what, what potential does a three-sector agricultural environment have on economic development, given the perspective that uh, the middle class works well for economic growth and development? Brilliant. In fact, uh, this idea of a trimodal as opposed to a dualistic agrarian sector has become more popular perhaps with um, some successful smallholders accumulating and some big farms being divided up. Certainly a model that uh, has happened in some pockets of Zimbabwe, but has not been pursued in South Africa where we've been redistributing land without subdividing uh, privately titled properties. So last comments, I'm afraid we're gonna have to pull it to a close very soon. So a broad spectrum of, of issues and questions um, I would like to suggest that we have Professor Maloka, including your response on restitution, and then Dr. Akinola, uh, one and a half minutes each, and then let's wrap up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Holt. Uh, the gain uh, situation it has a different dimension. The easy, straightforward one is the Natal one. That one, I think, based on equality. Uh, uh, they are good prospects. Uh, the other one on Mozambique and others, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, frankly uh, beyond my reach. But the first part, based on equality and gender, there are ample authorities that she could easily rely on. And uh, should I just close my... Uh, Perhaps you'd like to just, uh, in closing, um, you know, I noticed that there isn't a conclusion uh, or a concluding chapter in the book, but is there any sort of, to your mind, a key takeaway message from the book that you hope others will build on in the future? Perhaps you could reflect on that? Well, 
The key takeaway, I, 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 I suppose uh, this is a life issue. All of us have to keep our eyes on the board, you know, because there are still development that are coming. Uh, in in a, a, a matter of this, you cannot rightly have a conclusion. As I said, it is, uh, there, there are other aspects that you have brought, Mamdani and others, which are, are, are very important. So I think the work for all of us and, and uh, uh, there's a lot, a lot to be done. I can't can really say there is a definitive uh, con conclusion. As I said, uh, I read the contribution as merely a starter. Maybe uh, uh, Aguinola will take us to, uh, to the desert soon. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Akinola, any responses to the last uh, comments on Zimbabwe and your own reflections on what you would like people to take away from this book before we wrap up? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, the, the, you know, issues on land are always complex and it, it depends on your perspective and where you are coming from. Uh, depends on the wisdom you have. And most of the time, it's extremely difficult to pass this across board and to make people reason along the same way you will reason along with. I understand the gender construction in terms of land redistribution. But if we want to believe that we are all human beings, then all the sexes should be afforded the opportunities to lay claim to land. But we understand the other arguments, which time will not permit me to actually comment on that. But what I really want people to take away is just that the, the quest for land agitation is actually a quest for good governance. It's, it's, a, it's a quest to end poverty, as we have seen in the South African case, whereby lands that were redistributed to some people have also been sold back to the original owner. So most of the time, it's not right to say that when we see all the wise men, all the farmers, that they all stole our lands. That assertion is not correct. Some of the lands are legitimately, uh, legitimately bought, and we know them. And expropriation might be good for some aspects of the reform agenda, but the question of land goes beyond just expropriation. There are deeper questions in terms of uh, government providing support system even to people that are already on the system. And, uh, thank you. I will not allow you to go further. On that note, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close. I'd like to thank very much our, our participants, first of all, um, who have remained with us. And um, it was great to hear from, from some of you directly. I hope that uh, all of you have taken something from this process uh, and that you will seek out the book and uh, the, the contributors and that we take this process forward. Uh, there are many big issues and themes that have emerged that suggests that the land question is complex. Um, South Africa's land question might be extreme, but it's not disconnected from what's happening in the rest of the continent or the rest of the world. Um, and yet it's deep, deeply historically rooted. Uh, so these are complex questions. I'd like to, again, thank um, the IPATC, that's the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conserva uh, Conversation at the University of Johannesburg for hosting us today and also acknowledge uh, the team at Palgrove Macmillan who worked on this book, um, uh, including um, their editors. I'd like to thank the co-editors of this book, uh, including uh, Dr. Akinola uh, for joining us today and all the contributors to the book who've, uh, who've attended today. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Professor Maloka as well. Uh, I'd also like to extend a thanks uh, to uh, Tandeka for supporting this event. Uh, that's Tandeka from IPATC and also uh, Theo and uh, Palesa at the UJ Library team. So with that, thank you very much. And I think in a moment, if one of our support staff can just uh, give an indication in the chat of where people can see this recording in the future, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much all. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.